Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here this morning. And as I said before, in the last couple of Sundays, good to be back in our buildings again and uh, worshipping, even if it is in a limited way. Uh, and we thank the Lord for being here and for this beautiful day uh, on which we can worship him. So um, there are just a few announcements just to, to say we're back in our building. That's great. But just, you know, tr- we should try and observe those social distancing rules uh, or, or, or protocols, you know, in the building and, and outside. So um, just to say that. Um, just to say also our midweek meeting is uh, 8.30 uh, this uh, Wednesday uh, here in Kilkenna Murray. And um, it's a bit of a different format because of the restrictions, but we are uh, worshipping via the, uh, or doing the midweek also via Zoom, video conferencing app, Zoom, if you want to make use of that. If you haven't before and you want to know how, just give me a ring and we'll, we'll work that out for you. Um, I've been asked by the, the minister in Ballyward Parish, I was, I was talking to him and he was asking me to uh, just announce their um, harvest celebrations next Sunday, uh, 27th of September. So they have their morning service, um, but they're also, there's a 3 p.m. old age service and a, actually an evening service, the preacher there that then being uh, Bishop Darren McCartney. So if you want to go to that, uh, you need to let them know because for social distancing reasons, they need to know numbers you're kind of booking in as it were um but just just to announce that um and of course our harvest services are coming up and we'll be doing something as well in both congregations for those also to say i believe that john mccabe is is getting married uh, to rachel rachel mcmahon uh on friday so uh we wish them well as a congregation and um uh, we wish them the lord's blessing uh, as well just to say that um, also to say, are we prayer meeting? Me and Mervyn there have started again praying. So you want to join us? Uh, we've it's just been out of, everyone's been out of sync recently and we've just been getting into things again. But we're going to start praying again for the service if you want to join us for that prayer meeting. So those are all the announcements. Um, I want to begin by reading a psalm, and as I, as I do, uh, by custom. And this is Psalm 108 and verses 1 to 6. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. Awake, O harp and lyre, I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth, that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer me. Amen. And may the Lord bless those great words of that uh, psalm to our hearts as we begin our worship. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just praise you that we are able to be here in our building again just to worship you uh, and be back in our buildings in Drumgulland and Kilkenna Murray. And uh, we want to worship you. We gather here to worship you this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, to give the glory that is due to your holy name. Uh, We worship you as the living God who has uh, sent to us uh, our Lord Jesus to be our Redeemer, to be our Savior. And we worship you, Lord Jesus, as uh, the King, the Lord of glory, um, who came to us, who has saved us through your your life, your death on the cross for our sins, your resurrection from the grave. Uh, And so we worship you, Lord Jesus, as the risen and exalted Lord, who came to us uh, as the humble saviour and submitted yourself even to the death of the cross, but who has been and is raised from the dead (coughs) and who has ascended uh, 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 and exalted uh, to the right hand of God the Father. So we praise you as the exalted uh, and risen saviour. And as we gather here, Lord God, uh, we also do so in the knowledge uh, of the presence of the Holy Spirit with us, who reveals to us the truth of Christ and who brings the joy of salvation to our hearts. And Heavenly Father, we, as we gather, we do confess our sin. We don't come here standing on our own righteousness or goodness. Uh, we confess that we are sinners. We thank you that because of the great love with which you have loved us in Christ, that we have forgiveness and redemption. And we confess, Heavenly Father, our sins before you, and we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your mercy and uh, for your help 
and enabling that we might, through the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, um, be more and more conformed to the image of Jesus, our Savior. So bless us, Heavenly Father, we pray for the remainder of our worship. And we do ask all of these things through and in the name of Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So um, we're going to sing and we remain seated and um, we sing softly. Uh, we're going to sing and uh, it's uh, our opening praise is 236, Sing to God New Songs of Worship. is from 1 Thessalonians, and it's uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 to uh, the end of the chapter, 4 to 10, verses 4 to 10. So uh, we'd read the first few verses uh, last Sunday, so we're reading to the end of uh, the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians. So let's hear the word of God. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Amen, and may the Lord bless to our hearts and minds this reading from Scripture, from his holy and an errant word. Now, boys and girls, uh, we have any boys and girls here this morning? Well, anyway, we do have one or two, so um, we do. So, um, good to see you, and um, I'm going to show something to you, okay? I'm take it out of this bag. I'm going to be careful to drop any of this stuff, so you'll see what it is in a wee minute here. Let's take it out. Uh, there we go. Anything else? There's another bit. And... Uh, yeah, a car, 
and uh, should be something else in here. Oh yeah, there we go. Right. Now, here's a question. Do any of you know what that is? Do you any of you have this at home? Nobody. This is this is Skelectric, right? Skelectric has been around forever. They had Skelectric when I was a kid. Uh, we our kids had it. Um, sitting in boxes now. I uh, don't even know whether this works anymore. Um, but th this is this the full scale Skelectric, and that's the Mini Skelectric Mini. In fact, there's a photograph I took of the box in the Monster um, Mini or Micro. I should say not Mini Micro Skelectric. Um, and it's it's slot car, you know, racing. Uh, you, you you race these wee cars around the track, and it's great fun. You race each other, and you go real fast, and you get them faster and faster and uh, you have races and stuff and you have to slow into the bends or your car will fly away off and uh, away off the track. So you can have lots of fun with this and um, you can actually add to the track and make it bigger um, and it starts to spread out everywhere. Okay, so you can race your cars around all these sort of very elaborate tracks because you keep adding to the tracks and adding wee bits and so on. And uh, say so we, we've had hours of fun in our house with Skelectric. Um, but you know, the point of Skelectric is, you know, you race, you, you go fast and you speed around the track and uh, you try and win your races and, and get around as quickly as you can. And the reason why I, I, I was thinking about that and uh, or, or talking about that is that this morning, uh, boys and girls, we are looking at a Bible passage um, in which um, we... Um, are talking about how Paul preached in the, in the city of Thessalonica and the, he says the gospel message went out so quickly round all the roads and tracks of, of the Greek world of Macedonia and people heard the gospel everywhere um, because there was a major Roman road went into Thessalonica, the city, and there were other roads and the gospel just began to spread everywhere down these, these roads very quickly. So by the time Paul was writing his letter, he says here, the Lord's message rang out from you, not just in Macedonia and Achaia, that's the whole Greek world. Um, your faith that God is known everywhere. And um, these early Christians spread the message, and the message about them spread, went down the, the roads and the tracks uh, very quickly and spread everywhere. And, you know, boys and girls, people... And all of us here, people receive that message with joy. Because that message is joy. It's the joy that Jesus has lived, died for our sins, been born into this world as God made flesh, has lived and died and risen again, died for our sins and risen, so that if we believe and trust in him, we are saved and redeemed from the judgment to come. And that is such a wonderful message. And people, it's spread everywhere. And I want you to know that message. I want you to know the joy of having Jesus as your savior. Just to know that joy, that wonderful joy of being saved through faith in Jesus. And, and then to spread that to others, to tell others about Jesus, uh, just like the early Christians did, to, to put it down the roads and the tracks and the places around here to let people know that gospel truth. So, and I want us to be a church and churches who, who do that as well. So, thanks very much for listening. I'm going to put this away and hopefully not uh, get, get it back safely into my bag here. Um, so thanks for listening uh, boys and girls now we're going to uh, bow our heads again in prayer let us pray Heavenly Father we do thank you for all of your goodness to us we, just, we thank you for this beautiful day in which we can gather here uh, and worship you um, we thank you for the, the good things that we receive from you every day that remind us that you are a uh, a God who provides for us, uh, for the food that you put on our tables, for the homes that we have, for the families that we, you've placed us in, for uh, every breath we breathe, every beat of our hearts is a gift from you, Lord. And we thank you for that and just for all your providence to us. Uh, and we thank you, Lord God, for being able to return to our buildings to worship over the last a uh, few weeks and, and we pray Lord God that you would continue to bless us as we return to worship in Drumgoolan and Kilkenna Murray and 
Also continue to bless our online services and uh, thank you, Father, for all who've helped out with that. Um, and, and indeed, all of those ministries in, in so many churches and congregations um, where the gospel message and the Bible, message of the Bible is going out, we pray your blessing upon all of that, Lord, and um, pray, Lord, that it would reach into the hearts and lives of people. Heavenly Father, we do pray for and, and remember this morning our doctors and nurses and our NHS staff at this time. We pray you would sustain them and help them in their role uh, in the midst of this pandemic. And we pray you would grant them and our government, both locally and nationally, wisdom to deal with this uh, ongoing situation as, as cases now rise again. Uh, we pray for, for wisdom for our politicians and our doctors and, and our nurses and healthcare uh, uh, workers. We pray, oh Lord God, for all who are sick amongst us at this time. And we pray, Father, that you'd be near to them, uh, that you'd comfort them, that you would enable them to look to you um, to turn to Christ, to find the consolation of Christ as friend and saviour. Indeed, help us all, Lord, each and every day to know and find that consolation of the Lord Jesus Christ as our saviour and Lord. We thank you for and we pray for uh, John and Rachel and their uh, uh, wedding, uh, their uh, wedding coming up this, this Friday, and, and we, we pray, Lord, your blessing upon them uh, and upon their lives together. So we, we commit them to you as well. And we pray, Lord God, for ourselves. We pray for each one of us here that as we go about our daily lives, we pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be those filled with the joy of the gospel, those who look to Christ as our Savior and Lord and who have that joy and, and that desire to tell other people about Christ uh, and to live our lives for Christ. So be with us uh, for the remainder of our worship, we ask, and we pray all of these things, Heavenly Father, now uh, in your presence and through it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So we come now to our uh, Bible passage. These services uh, are obviously shorter. We have only two hymns, and uh, we're trying to keep it down to uh, a sort of shorter service format. So I want to spend a few moments just reflecting uh, on this passage of Scripture uh, that we read from First Thessalonians. One of the effects of the, the lockdown is that, um, you know, because of the coronavirus and the lockdown, there has been a, a restriction on travel. And, uh, yeah, we still travel about, but, you know, we were very restricted during the lockdown. And even now, we're not going as far as we would have gone. And, you know, things are still restricted. And, and, and of course, we hope and we pray that in time these restrictions will be lifted and we will once again be able to travel and go about more freely and without restrictions. But generally, you know, in the modern world, we, we, we take communication and travel for granted. It's something that is there and, and we, we have, you know, um, in, in ways that previous generations didn't have and, and we do sort of take it for granted. Um, and I start by saying that because this is a passage, as I was saying earlier to the, to the kids, in which we are told how the news of the gospel travels throughout the Greek-speaking world. Um, something that Paul was very grateful for uh, and overjoyed about. Um, the ancient peoples did, you know, and particularly in the Roman Empire, there was uh, very good communication systems for that time, uh, and, and news could spread very quickly, and, and it did, and Paul was very grateful for that. And I want this morning to look at some of the essential truths of that gospel that Paul mentions as spreading and traveling. Um, last Sunday, we, we spoke um, about and focused on Paul's gratitude to God for this newly founded Thessalonian church, and uh, we focused on the first few verses, and his thankfulness to God for their active faith, for their labor of love, for their hope in Christ, which endures or which produces endurance. We also uh, noted his ministry of prayer for these churches, uh, both himself and alongside others. He prayed for these uh, Thessalonians and he prayed for all of the congregations, uh, something that we should be doing as well uh, on our own and with others is praying for our churches and for the wider church. And um, <clears throat> as I said last Sunday, he continues in this mode of thanksgiving through the entire first chapter. Thessalonians, the, the first chapter of First Thessalonians is really the thanksgiving section 
of Paul's letter. And so Paul continues in these verses to express his appreciation before the Lord for these Thessalonian believers. And in his continued thanksgiving for these Thessalonian Christians, the Apostle Paul points us, as I've said, to important gospel truths or important truths about the gospel. And I want to take a few moments just, moments just to focus on those gospel truths that, that Paul points us to. So first of all, in verses uh, 4 to 5, um, Paul speaks about how these believers have received, how they have received the gospel. He teaches us about how the gospel is received, truly received, uh, not just heard, but, but received into the heart. He starts by saying, for we, we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. To begin with, it's, it's worth pointing out that through their faith in Christ, Paul now sees these Thessalonian uh, Christians as brothers, as his brothers, they, or you could, you could translate it brothers and sisters. Um, uh, through salvation, we are received into a new family, a spiritual family. When you look to Christ and trust in Christ, your Savior, you are received into the family of God in Christ and belong to a new family. But we also see uh, from what Paul says in verse 4 that salvation is also God's sovereign gift to the believer. Salvation does not come from you and me or originate in us. It does not come from man. As Paul says in verse 4, it is God who has chosen these Thessalonian believers through the hearing of the gospel. He has chosen them. And I don't want to now plumb the, the depths of the doctrine of divine election, uh, which is a clearly biblical doctrine, but, but the word that he uses there, chosen, can also be translated election. And we see also that Paul refers to them as loved by God. He says, brothers, loved by God. And it is through God's choosing and electing love for a person that they are saved. Uh, through the hearing of the gospel and come to faith. The gospel is, a point, is accompanied uh, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And an important outworking of that for us who hear and believe the message of the Lord Jesus is that for each of us as believers, we can rejoice in the fact that God has saved us because he has loved us in Christ and sent Christ to die for us. You know, I don't need to earn God's love. God has already loved me by sending Christ to die for me and saving me through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And that's a wonderful truth. That's, that just, that's a liberating and wonderful truth. But Paul goes on then in verse 5 to tell these believers why he is certain that they have truly received Christ. It's because of how they've received his message. These Thessalonians heard through Paul the gospel message of Christ's death for their sins on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, not just as the words of a preacher, but as truly good news for them. As he, Paul says in verse 5, our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power. And the term gospel there means good, Greek word euangelion means good news, glad tidings, good news. And so it was a well-known term in Paul's day in the Greek-speaking world. Uh, they used that word gospel generally to refer to the heralding of good news, uh, mostly to do with the emperor. Um, you know, they, they use that word gospel to speak of, to, to herald the emperor's victories or his, his generosity or whatever. Um, but you see, Paul and the other gospel preachers, they took that word gospel and they applied it to Christ and said, this is the good news. This is the really good, this is the true good news. Uh, and they proclaimed the good news that Christ is the true Lord and King and that by his birth, his coming into the world as God made flesh, his life, um, his death on the cross for our sins, his bodily resurrection, he has saved us 
from sin and death. That's the good news. And these Thessalonians heard that good news and they embraced that good news and they believed on Christ as their Savior and Lord. And they received it as such because Paul's gospel message was accompanied with power. Through the Holy Spirit, as he says in verse 5, there was a miraculous convicting power that accompanied Paul's message and which brought about deep conviction in these Thessalonians whereby they turn from their sin and they trust in Christ with full certainty. They heard this gospel message with, with deep conviction and they received Christ then through repentance and faith. But of course we know as we were, we were reading last week in Acts chapter 17 of how Paul brought the gospel message to Thessalonica and we know from Acts 17 that many others who heard the same message rejected it. But it, it's a message that comes with the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of those who believe. And the question I have for you then this morning or, or, or today is how have you heard and received this message? Many, many preachers have stood in this pulpit over many, many years, decades, and preached the same message. How have you received and heard that message? Have you received this gospel message, this good news about Jesus as the one who has saved you from sin by his death on the cross, who has risen from the dead to bring you new and eternal life, have you received it into your hearts and believed on Christ as your, save, as your Savior? Do you hear this message with conviction? Or are you in the category who hear and reject? There's a challenge. Secondly then, as we see in verse 6, The effect of the gospel in the lives of these Thessalonians is something that Paul brings out here. Paul tells these Thessalonian Christians, you have become imitators of us and indeed of the Lord. And then he, he explains actually in the, the second clause of that verse what, what he means by that. He says that in spite of severe suffering for their faith, they have received the gospel message with joy. You see, salvation brings about a reorientation of a person's life. These Thessalonian believers became, says Paul, in their hearts like Paul and indeed imitators of the Lord himself. They held to Christ. They suffered for the truth. Their lives were changed. So that despite their suffering for the truth, they now held firmly to the truth of God and the true worship of God and the truth of Christ. You see, folks, the mark of a true believer is that they no longer conform to this world, but they behold the truth of Christ and they hold on to God's truth despite rejection and affliction. These Thessalonians suffered because of their conversion to Christ. They were no doubt rejected by their families, by their fellow citizens for turning to Christ. You see, it's, it's part of the cost of being a true believer that we will suffer for our faith. That we will suffer antagonism and opposition for our faith in Christ and our holding to the truth of God's word. We are going in a different direction to this fallen world. And this age. So these believers were experiencing this opposition which brought suffering to them. And Paul experienced the same opposition. He knew what it was like himself. Christ himself was rejected for his testimony to the truth. But you see, and I was saying this in our last midweek actually, this experience of isolation and suffering 
for our faith in Christ is simply part of our salvation. And so when we suffer for our faith, when we are rejected by others and opposed and maltreated for our faith in the Lord Jesus or for holding to the truth of God's word, we are experiencing what believers have experienced throughout the generations. But as Paul says here, these Thessalonians, despite their suffering, welcomed the gospel with joy, a joy that was given to them by the Holy Spirit. You see, even as we suffer for our faith in Christ and and what is true according to God's word, there is a consoling joy. Joy in the midst of that suffering because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, a joy that cannot be taken away from us. Thirdly then, in in verses 7 and 8, we are taught about the importance of gospel testimony and proclamation. This gospel is something that spreads because of how these Thessalonians have received the gospel with true conviction and saving power. They have become, as we see in verse 7, a pattern for other believers in Macedonia and Achaia, the entire Greek world. Macedonia was the northern province, Achaia the southern. It was the entire Greek world. And beyond beyond, as Paul says, everywhere. We were saying last Sunday that Thessalonica was a very connected city. It was a metropolitan place. And it was a trading hub, major trading hub in the Roman, in the, in the Roman Empire. It was served by, or, or it was connected by a major Roman road called the Via Ignatia, which uh, ran west-east across Macedonia and then You could went across the Adriatic into Italy uh, and to Rome. Um, And another major trading route actually running from the Danube in the north right down to the Peloponnese ran just west of Thessalonica. Um, So these Macedonians, uh, including Thessalonians, were a very connected, outward-looking people and had been for generations. You know, Alexander the Great was a Macedonian. And he conquered the world as far as India. You know, the Macedonians were a very outward-looking, connected kind of people. And so Paul's news of of preaching, uh, the news of Paul's preaching and, and and the faith of these new believers in Thessalonica began to spread around the highways and the roads and the tracks through Macedonia. So by the time Paul wrote this letter, he sent Timothy initially to uh, find out what was going on. But by the time Timothy came back and reported, and by the time he had, was writing this letter, Paul was hearing report, reports about these Christians and their message. And that filled him with joy. He was overwhelmed with joy. Through the Thessalonian church, the gospel message, as Paul says in verse 8, rang out from you. And that word rang out is, is the same, the Greek word is the same root word that we get our word echo from. You know, it echoed, it reverberated out. So what Paul is saying is that through the news of what happened in Thessalonica in terms of Paul's preaching the gospel, and no doubt also the evangelistic efforts of the Thessalonians themselves, Christians themselves, the gospel message was spreading and being proclaimed and reverberating in other places. Indeed, that's why Paul actually chose to preach his message to these population centers like Thessalonica, which had, they reckon, up to about 100,000 people in it, these Greek cities, because he knew that the message would more easily spread out from them to other places. But Paul is overjoyed. He's overjoyed at the testimony of these Thessalonians, summed up in those key phrases, you know, in verse 8, uh, the Lord's message rang out from you. Your, your faith has become known everywhere. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. And this is even to the point where Paul himself is finding that the gospel message is already known in other places. Um, That's what he means when he says to translate the end of that, uh, um, to translate, I've got the end of verse 8 there, but to translate literally the end of verse 8, so that we have no need to say anything. We have no need to say anything. The gospel message had already reached places 
and Paul found that it had already had been established. And really what I want to say from that is that a church that has truly received the gospel will itself become a proclaiming church. which brings the message to others. You know, and as I think about these Thessalonian Christians bringing the gospel across the roads and travel routes of Macedonia, I can't help thinking that one of the positive aspects of the lockdown and this epidemic, and I know there's lots of tragedy and, and, and negative aspects to it, but one of the positive aspects is that the gospel message has in our day gone out through the internet in ways that it hadn't before, through all sorts of churches and congregations. And, and you know, that's a ministry and a work that we need to keep embracing and that we need to pray for. And finally then in verses 9 and 10, we are taught about the hope of the gospel. The report has gone out that these Thessalonians, um, that they have turned from idols to serve the true and living God. Uh, they receive Paul's message uh, according to its truth as the word of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and Paul was just, he just straightforwardly preached that message. The plain truth of the gospel. And these Thessalonians were convicted but totally transformed by the truth of this message. You know, in the ancient world, philosophers and traveling teachers would often enter a city with great pomp and, and hype, making a grand entrance, uh, stirring people up with excitement and curiosity. They are as much showmen as they were uh, philosophers and teachers. By contrast, Paul simply went into the, and his companions, went into the, the synagogue in Thessalonica and over three Sabbaths proclaimed the straightforward message of the gospel. And as, they, as, as he did so, the power of God accompanied that message and brought salvation. And the result was salvation for those who heard and believed. And as we learn here through their faith in Christ, these Thessalonians had a new hope. They turned from idols to worship the true and living God. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ meant a complete break with their past. The word turned there in, in verse 9, turned to God from idols, speaks of a radical reorientation of their lives towards Christ and through Christ towards the living God. Their turning away from idols was actually an enormous step for these Thessalonians because idol worship, as in all Greek cities, would have been woven into the social and political life of Thessalonica. Not just in terms of the honoring of the traditional Greek and Roman gods, but also the honoring and worshiping of the Roman emperor as a god. And so they're, they're turning away from all that, refusing to participate in it anymore, would have been a costly and radical break from their past lives. And that's why they suffered. As Paul says earlier, they suffered. But you see, that's what true saving faith in the Lord Jesus entails. We too, through faith in the Lord Jesus, we must give up the idols of this age. Those things that the world wants us to revere and worship. And we must be faithful to Christ alone. And whilst these Thessalonian believers suffered for their turning away from their pagan past, yet they were sustained by this new hope that Paul speaks of here. The gospel brings to the heart of a believer, to our hearts, a new hope. They hoped, as Paul says in verses 9 and 10, in the risen Christ. They now look to Christ and they worship him and they wait upon him. Is that what we're doing? And this waiting isn't just a passive thing. Waiting upon the Lord is never passive in the Bible. It's an active thing. It's an act of hope whereby the believer waits upon the one who is, as Paul says here, God's son from heaven. In other words, they look to Christ as the exalted Lord 
ascended into glory, seated at the right hand of God, and who will come again. Their lives and their hearts are orientated towards this exalted and risen and exalted Christ. And they also look to Christ as the one who has defeated death. He was raised, as Paul says, he was raised from the dead, whom he raised from the dead. So they look to him as we look to Christ, knowing that in Christ's resurrection is the hope of our own resurrection. That all who trust in Christ will be raised with him bodily when he returns at the end of this age. They also hope in Christ as as the man Jesus, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus. The man Jesus, God made flesh. The man Jesus, who has lived and died for us in our place and who is raised from the dead, who is our advocate and our friend. And finally, finally, they look to Christ as the one who saves us from the coming wrath. You see, there is, folks, a wrath to come. Paul speaks about it very clearly here. I was reading Romans this morning before I went out, the first chapters of Romans, and he speaks about it very clearly there. And other parts of the, of the scriptures speak about the wrath to come. There is a wrath coming against sin. There is a day of judgment. which the Bible clearly proclaims. But you see, the crucified, risen, and ascended Lord Jesus will appear at the end of this age, and he will save his people from the wrath to come. That is the essence of the good news. That he saves us, the Lord Jesus, from the wrath of God. And so Paul teaches us then important truths about the gospel through this passage. Let's be those then who, like the Thessalonians, receive the good news with joy, who proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus to those around us, who endure with joy the opposition of this world because of the hope that we have in Christ, knowing that through faith in him we are saved from the judgment to come. And if you don't yet know Christ as your Savior, hear the good news, not just as the words of a preacher, but hear the good news as good news for you and believe on him who saves you from sin and death. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. You are, even as we are here now, Lord, so, Lord Jesus, you are now seated at the right hand of God, and you are the advocate and saviour of all who put their trust in you by the blood of your cross. And we praise you for that. And I pray, Father, that each and every one here would look to and trust in and know Christ as saviour. And so I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing our final hymn then, um, which is uh, 514, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness.
love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.